I'm John Herter. It's Tuesday, the 24th day of August. Great as always to have you along, everybody. In a nutshell, From the Experts is a compressed virtual networking accelerator, helping people across industries connect very quickly in a brief, moderated, interactive show format. It's like a TED Talk with interactive discussion. So how does a show work? Well, there's the expert talk followed by group discussion, where you can share questions and feedback verbally and with text in the chat box. What's in it for you? The FT promise, if all goes well, your curiosity spark new ideas, accelerate into action, and you may have helped yourself and someone else solve that problem, make the connection, reaching the opportunity faster. We know making authentic connections and expanding your networks has never been more important for your business and your well-being. Folks, help me welcome our guest expert, David Mullins, CEO and General Manager of WFSU Public Media. Since the end of 2015, David's led the operations of the PBS and NPR stations that serve Tallahassee and Panama City regions, northern Florida for some of you folks. FS, WFSU delivers a diverse bundle of broadcast and streaming services into multiple public and private consumer market segments. So please connect with David on LinkedIn. Learn more about WFSU on WFSU.org. So comparing notes a couple months back, we discussed some of the moves WFSU has been making in the business to position itself, to better adapt to changing consumer behaviors in a very competitive landscape. So David, in the FTE spirit of learning from the other guy's toolkit, thanks a lot for coming in to break it down and discuss it with us today. Well, thanks, John. And it's great to be here with you and with the FTE group on the FTE show. And I certainly look forward to seeing what other businesses are doing in this area during our interactive discussion period here at the end. Let me just kind of dive into what I've got to, to share with you briefly. You know, the core of what I want to uh, talk about today is something that I hope can be applicable to uh, most of us in the various industries and customer environments that we, that we work in. You know, this is going to be my story or our story, uh, but the core message can hopefully be applicable to others as we all are facing the challenge of adapting to consumer behaviors, right? And right. we're searching for ways to monetize on those, uh, those changes. Uh, I'm going to be sharing stuff that we're doing here at WFSU in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, but certainly please uh, share what you're doing uh, in your businesses and what you're trying. Let me share my screen here real quick. Got it. Uh, da, 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 there it is. So uh, for those of you in the States, uh, just to let you know, we're not your parents PBS anymore. Uh, the traditional business model for donor support for local PBS and NPR stations it's really becoming obsolete. Uh, it's with the increased pace of and the move to digital platforms for viewers and listeners as they consume content. Public broadcasters are facing the challenge of attracting and retaining these viewers, and more importantly, the supporters uh, of public broadcasting in, in this what is really a hyper competitive market environment. Uh, these challenges are similar to what uh, newspapers had faced uh, in their area, and the same challenges that we face are what commercial television stations and cable networks are increasingly facing. So let me just kind of show you in a nutshell. This is what kind of the traditional business model is for, for a public media station. There is government support uh, of federal and state dollars. Here we go. You can see my cursor, you can't. Uh, you are seeing my screen, right? Yeah, I got it. We're good. Okay, got you. Yeah, should have asked that before. Government support, it comes in the form of grants of federal dollars and some, some states, not all states, provide uh, state support uh, at, at the government level. There's business support that uh, is what we call, and I think what John, you call on for the FTE show, underwriting. It's, it's business sponsors of yeah. programming. We have production services for hire that uh, we utilize our facilities to, to work for clients. Uh, some institutions like WFSU are licensed, the, our broadcast license is held by an, an institution here, it's Florida State University. 
and uh, in, in, in other in other markets, there are other universities, and in some cases, it's just uh, community groups that hold the broadcast license. Uh, but the the thing that we want to focus on really is the donor support. Uh, that's what we're focusing on uh, in in our discussion today, because uh, it's while traditionally uh, viewers and listeners have responded to, and if you're in the States and you have watched or listened to PBS or NPR, raise your hand if you know what a pledge drive is. Pledge drives, uh, uh, those, those types of appeals, and certainly direct mail appeals uh, in the past. And while we're to continue to do that, uh, this type of response to these uh, ways that we raise funds uh, is decreasing. Now, this pie chart looks all equal. It's just really just a representation of what uh, what the various uh, uh, revenue streams can be for, for an organization. We all want that donor support uh, section of the pie chart to be as large as possible. You know, we, we have a saying in, in public broadcasting, when you've seen one PBS station, you've seen one PBS station. So while there are similarities, we're all different uh, in lots of ways. Let me just give you a quick overview of what WFSU Public Media You got to pick the speed up, just so you know. Okay, I've got to pick my speed up. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> on the broadcasting side, uh, we are we, we provide two PBS broadcast stations. Each of those are providing four program services. We have two NPR radio stations, two classical music stations. We pro provide a 24-7 uh, C-SPAN-like uh, state uh, or, uh, program service called the Florida Channel. So lots of things happening on the broadcast side, but on the digital space, we're streaming services, live, you know, live streaming our PBS channel, live streaming our kids channel, live streaming the Florida channel, and also uh, providing as many as 14 simultaneous events uh, via streaming. We're audio streaming all of our radio stations. We have a mobile app. We have on-demand streaming for our local television programs, plus a large library of PBS programs, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. So just a, we've got as much happening in the digital space as on the broadcast side. So that leads us to the problem. You know, how this is our problem. How can we kind of, we can't pivot immediately or even over a short period of time after decades of infrastructure investment on the broadcast side. So our challenge is how do we attract and, and, and maintain, attract new uh, listeners and viewers uh, in this competitive market, but at the same time, continue to uh, maintain what we do in this linear broadcast model and serve that audience as it's diminishing. So essentially, you know, what we're doing is we're, we're moving a portion of our current customer base to a digital world or, or moving with them to a digital world, attracting new customers, new uh, donors, while at the same time maintaining that service to appeal to those customers who just want to. The, the, the fear that we all have in, in, in media, uh, in the linear service of media, is that while five years ago, uh, everybody was watching, tuning in to television when it was available. Now, the streaming services and on-demand viewing and, and consumption of media is fast, uh, very fast coming uh, to, to where it's going to cross uh, and, and become the dominant way that people consume media. Just two years ago, or even just last year, that fall 22 intersection really was pushed out, had been pushed out to as far as, far as fall of 2023, so, or summer of 2023. So it's rapidly changing. It's accelerated. In, and during the pandemic, we suspect it's, uh, it's even uh, accelerated even faster. So what has, has WFSU done? Well, we've established what we call the BHAG, the Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. And that goal is to increase our monthly sustaining donors. Those are donors that provide a regular contribution to WFSU every month. It's a consistent way uh, to, and in for many ways, the preferred way for a donor to provide support. It's certainly our preferred way because we have that consistency. But in that, those small, easy, regular chunks, uh, our goal is to get 75% of our total donor base to that level uh, by 2025. You know, we've also recognized that we need to educate 
uh, the online consumer to the fact that the content is available online, but if you're not used to hearing those, if you're used to hearing those regular messaging of it's time to support public television or public radio, and if you're not hearing that necessarily when you are streaming a program, well, we've got to we've got to figure out how we can get to that audience. Exactly. So we put together, a, a, you know, over the over time, a, a, a number of, of of projects. Well, I want to share one thing that we did just within the past year that we thought would really work pretty well, uh, but just never gained traction. We we initiated a Facebook campaign of of buying uh, promotion. Uh, uh, during outside of a regular uh, pledge drive on on air pledge drives and targeting new audiences with that Facebook campaign, right. short videos about programs and services that we provide, and then also soliciting donations. The outcome on the donation side was literally nothing. However, what we realized is we were we were providing a platform for for building awareness, and we actually uh, requested feedback to a survey and got over nine hundred responses, which is phenomenal. How many? 900, over 900 responses. Wow. So, you know, we needed, uh, what we realized is while it's great for building brand awareness, we maybe needed to spend more time doing that before we actually got to the solicitation phase of this. So uh, one thing I do want to, you know, there, there are just other things that it's really don't have enough time to really go into, but we've had some successes with all of these projects. The biggest success that we've had though is what we call the WFSU PBS Passport video streaming service. Essentially what this is, is it is a locally branded, uh, let me, sorry, let me get to this next slide. It's locally branded uh, uh, local content in addition to national PBS programming, but all of that local content is, is there for free. And some of the PBS content is free, but the majority of that PBS content, the hundreds and hundreds of hours is there behind a paywall? It's it's no different than Netflix or Hulu, but that paywall is based on a person's donor support of the local PBS station. This has been extremely successful tool for building those monthly sustaining donors. And in fact, over the past two years, WFSU has increased that monthly sustaining percentage uh, uh, significantly, and now grew the the number of sustaining donors by, by more than 50%. So we're just under 6,000 donors that provide WFSU monthly sustaining contributions. And that's well over half of our 11,000 plus donor and members that, that support the, the station. So, so we're over, we're at, uh, over about 50, we're at about 55% towards that 75% goal now. So back to that curve that you showed, this, the passport is your backbone into the future. And, and it is, yeah, For, on the video side, on the video streaming side, yes. Right, interesting. And one of the things I noticed too, David, can you go back to a slide that showed kind of your, your BHAG, your yeah. things you're doing? And one of the things uh, you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, if you could tell that story about uh, you found out what the, the most interest came from was. Uh, oh, yeah, with, with our weekly uh, programming yeah. newsletters that yeah. we send out, people uh, opt in to, to receive those programming newsletters. And it's, you know, we, we promote, obviously, our programming and, and other uh, activities that the station is doing in the community. But the, the most clicked on area of that newsletter is, is our weekly recipe. Interestingly enough, we, we put a recipe at the bottom of the newsletter. We know people are at least opening it and scrolling to the bottom because they're opening that, that, that recipe. Uh, to find out what what what. Oh, uh, what so, quick question. Like. I mean, knowing that, I mean, how are you going to leverage that? Right, that's what they're interested in. Yeah, yeah. You build on that. We could, you know, that's something you and I talked about. Is that uh, there? There could be ways that we could uh, bring in, uh, you know, some sort of association, either with maybe a a, a, a guest chef build that some sort of virtual uh, cooking environment. Right. Uh, there's lots of things I think that we could we could do. It also tells us that there are ways that we have not, obviously there are ways that we have not implemented of really strategically targeting people within their own areas of interest, even programmatically. 
yeah. that, that that's, that's an area of growth for us. Last thing I wanted to relate real quickly on this mm -hmm. uh, slide uh, are your strategic or your your action plan here is very similar to all businesses. I can see Grant. Mm -hmm. I know he's you know doing the same thing. I know Matt. I mean everybody here. So it is interesting to see that while your approach during Facebook, you know, was a success, but it wasn't the way you did. And then the recipes where well, you're going to go back and leverage another part of your program to try to pull that in. And that, so it's a multi-phased mm -hmm. deal. So yeah, it is. Uh, so, Matt, you know, we, 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 we haven't pro we have not solved our problem yet. You right. know, we're on the way to solving it, but uh, I welcome, you know, comments and ideas that folks may have on, uh, telling us how you you think that we can solve it. Yeah, thanks. So yeah. today is. I'll stop sharing my screen here. That, that's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, folks. Today's show is brought to you by our underwriters, Arion, the full service project engineering firm, respected, trusted, highly valued by select energy industry clients. Porter Hedges, attorneys at law, the informed choice for complicated litigation in the energy business, and Unique Ventures the energy hybrid technology accelerator with a unique approach to venture capital. Interpoint, protecting what you care about most, people, profits, brand, and environment. Alliance Benefit Group, building retirement plans for your business that work. From the Experts is excited to announce new partnerships with the Canon and Ecosystems 2030. We're collaborating to bring our strengths together into new unique combinations to enhance your experience. More to come on that. So, uh, with that, I can see we had a couple of questions coming, but let's, uh, David, let's open the floor and get some of this feedback from the group going. Okay. While we do that, can you see those two questions? I'm going to go ahead and turn on the poll real quick. I can see the, the questions. You want me to, can I respond to a couple yeah. of these oh, questions, John? Yep. Yeah, you know, Matt, Matt Bell, you had the question of what's the demographic distribution of your, of your donor base. Uh, the, the, the typical do donor of public television, and this is pretty, pr pretty consistent across the country, Matt, is, is female 60 plus. Uh, for public radio, it's still going to skew uh, primarily female, but not, but not quite as, as dramatically female over male. And then that, that, that demographic age is, falls back to at least five years to maybe 55 or 50. Therein lies a, an issue for us, right? Is is that that de that demographic of the, in particular the traditional viewer and listener is aging, and the the streaming the the on demand content for audiences is and meeting them where they want to be. That's that's the key for, and it's not just public. Television or radio, it's it's why it's why Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime and all of the streaming services, and why all of the networks like ABC and CBS and Disney are are targeting audiences in that way to meet them where they want to be. Uh, Got so, it. yeah, and the the, the Catherine uh, asked, does the BHAG change? by region, depending on the interest of audiences. Well, that's our BHAG here. I mean, certainly I think a BHAG for a public television or radio station in Montana or New England uh, or California could be possibly similar, but I'm sure that we all are gonna have our, particularly our ways of, uh, of any specific strategies to, to reach. And, and it could, some of it's based on capacity too the ability to, to do some of the things that we even talk about, we recognize we just don't have the capacity to do just yet. Right. So folks, uh, please continue to answer the poll. Feel free to step up to the mic, drop your questions uh, and feedback into the chat like you're doing. Uh, and if I call on you and uh, you're welcome to pass, no, no, no judgment there. So keeping it brief, just say your name and company uh, when you share your comment. And uh, Rydell, thanks a lot for leaving uh, the question in the chat box, which is, hey, as a consumer, uh, sentiment and behaviors continue to change during coronavirus, how will you and your business adapt and change to retain those customers and attract more? Uh, to get a non another nonprofit view on this, Cindy, can I pick on you to share your take? You most certainly can. Hello, John. <laughs> 
And uh, I really love, I just have to say, the BHAG terminology uh, is wonderful. I am a fan of using the BHD term, better known as the big hairy deal, <laughs> David. Yeah. So yeah. in the policy world in which uh, I traffic, mm -hmm. that is, um, that's a popular term for us internally. Anyway, <laughs> so as a fellow nonprofit, uh, organization, our members are business leader CEOs from across the country and companies. We engage them in policy making and generating public policy solutions. And we too have to make sure that we're doing everything we can do to attract and retain um, our members. And a recent strategy that we utilized was creating a specific, we call it a community page. So it's something that's customized to each member where they can log on to their own page that we've created on our website. And they can, they can designate which content that they want to receive and when they want to receive it. And it also lists our latest and greatest resources because we produce a lot of economic research, a lot of insights for business. And so they're able to get the broad picture of big resources throughout the organization, which is quite large. And then they're able to further tailor it to their specific needs. So the idea is to deliver highly customized, relevant contact uh, content in an effective and efficient manner so they can access it very quickly. And so that's something that we've done that we've listened to in terms of the needs for resources because business leaders are making decisions every hour, every day, every week, and they really need to have the most up-to-date and interesting data and, and research. Mm -hmm. Any feedback, yeah. Any feedback uh, to Cindy on that or questions? So, Cindy, I've got a question. You, you, in order to do that, you had to really kind of have a backbone, uh, a, a, an IT backbone to support this customization, basically, for each client. How did you go about doing that? We did definitely have a backbone of the resources organization-wide. So it was quite a task, um, at least six to nine months in the making that I'm aware of. I was not part of the IT development team on that mm -hmm. side of, of the equation. Um, but we were asked for input for our particular our organizations broken down into different centers. And so we were asked for input to give, you know, ideas based on what we know about our own, you know, members about what would be valuable for them. So it was creating a portal basically that's password protected Mm -hmm. uh, for them to access. And again, it's similar in terms of the paywall, you know, if they're not a member, they can't access, you know, most of the information. Some of it is publicly available, like you were describing um, on your website, but most mm -hmm. of it, the good stuff, you need to be a, a paying right. customer. But it did take a lot of work to create that particular page, that portal, and then the ability for them to make the choices in terms of the content that they want to see anytime they log in. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so Brian uh, Skeels adds in, hey, do you see a shrinking attention span by viewers when disseminating information and general content? And how do you edit to size without losing or skewing that message? You know, I think that the shrinking attention span, uh, I, I, I'm, I think it may be somewhat of a misnomer because I think People, if you've got the right content, you keep their attention, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and really, I think you find it, uh, regardless of what, what you're viewing this on, whether it's on your phone, on your computer, if you've got it hooked to a smart TV to, to, do, to do things. Uh, but we, we, uh, we do try to promote, if we're doing things to promote a television program, right. and we're using Facebook, for example. I mean, we, you know, you're gonna you're gonna provide a 30 second, 60 second kind of clip to just kind of hook them so that you'll they will they will be looking for that, right? Uh, but 
And, you know, I may be, maybe my interpretation of, of what I, I think maybe a lot of folks may feel is a kind of a shrinking attention span of, of people in general. Am I, am I wrong with my assumption? I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> my, my, yeah, there you go. Thank you, John. Yeah. Demonstration. Uh, I don't know. Anybody have feedback? So as you were thinking about that, uh, Matt sends in, hey, have you signed up to receive donations from Amazon Smile before? Uh, it can become a significant source of funds if you ask your donor base and ask them and their families to choose your organization to receive donations when they shop. What's your take on that? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm not sure if we have. Uh, I've got our development director, John Kwok, who is actually on this uh, session and muted. John, are you aware if we have ever tried Amazon Smile to, to get ourselves involved with Amazon Smile for that? Uh, David, hi. Hi, everyone. No, we have hi. not not tried Amazon Smile. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of these Great things idea. that uh, it's, it's possible to down the road, but currently we have not gone that direction. Yeah. yeah. It's things like that, though, uh, Matt, are, are, are great ideas to, to get in front of us. Uh, so because we just may not think of, of, of that uh, automatically. So thank you. You know, one of the things that <clears throat> when we were talking, David, uh, I was like, well, is it a thing where we need to have the young people show the old people on like a broadcast show and tell, you know, <laughs> and you're like, no, that's not it. Can you so can you help me out there? Because I'm thinking, you know, when I turn to PBS, I'm watching, you know, I'm watching that. And I'm like, oh, we need to the young people need to teach the old people and then everybody will be, you know, streaming. What's your experience there? Uh, you know, I think that that was our mindset at one point about uh, that, that older viewers or older consumers, if you want to call them that, aren't, uh, aren't tech savvy enough to, to, uh, to kind of uh, respond to, to offerings in kind of in a digital world. I think that is, that is just a misnomer because I think there are as many non-techies that are 50 years and younger than there are 50 years and older. The, the older folks find if particularly when I'll use, and it's uh, folks may remember the, the multi uh, year, a huge success on PBS Downton Abbey from a few years back, multiple seasons. And when those programs became available to stream, right. The, the, the 85 year old grandmother who loved Downton Abbey, Abbey found a way to become a, a donor, a passport donor of their local PBS station so she could stream Downton Abbey nonstop. Yeah. Sweet. So, um, you know, just kind of moving on, I'd like to uh, see Elisa. Okay, you're coming from a little bit different uh, background and uh, your your business experience. Could, you know, what's your take on all this? Sure. Hi, I'm Alisa Su Young. I'm coming from the perspective of a video marketing company, actually. So, our audience is a little different than yours. Um, we do not have 30 minute an hour programs. We have about four minutes max to get mm -hmm. a customer's, uh, uh, well, a viewer's attention. We don't market for ourselves. Mainly we market for our customers. So our customers might be looking at a 30 second ad or up to a four minute explainer video. Now that attention spin is very important. Mm -hmm. Like you said, um, on social media, you can, you know, catch people's attention for a little bit to explore more. So your um, social media ad might be for people to go watch the full video. For us, um, the full video is usually online and it's to get people to go to the website of a company or go book a demo for, with that um, client of our, ours to get to know their company a little more. Just so you know, we look a lot at what marketing statistics are and about eight seconds, eight seconds online. If you don't catch the attention of your customer by eight seconds, you have lost them completely. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever used YouTube or Facebook and watch their video where they have an ad in the beginning, they will tell you, you can skip this ad after eight seconds mm -hmm. <laughs> or five seconds. Mm -hmm. So if you don't catch your attention by that time, 
you're done. Mm -hmm. um, they won't watch the rest of your video, not even that 30 second. Um, so attention span is shortened. Mainly, I think, and we see a lot of noise. There is so much content online. Um, it's endless. So it's very important to put your teaser out there in the very beginning. So then people will want more. You don't want to give them everything, but you want to give them enough to say, hey, I want to watch more. Mm -hmm. um, David, I want to thank you. I am not in Florida, but I grew up, uh, I, I was an American for until I was 10. When I first got to US, you no know, cable television wasn't mm -hmm. that big at a time. PBS taught me English. So um, I watched Between the Lions and other TV shows That's that great. help teach kids. And I will say, a suggestion from somebody who's not in the 60s yet. Um, <laughs> I'm not young enough to be watching a lot of PBS uh, educational shows, but I'm also not old enough to be uh, consuming PBS uh, more uh, Downton Abbey type of show, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, I would say nostalgia plays a lot into streaming services. Um, okay. yeah. Right now, a lot of Netflix, um, Netflix shows or Hulu have bring back that classic television that people in my generation watch when they were 10 or 12. Um, maybe PBS stations can, with their subscription, put some um, archival contents to say, hey, if you subscribe, you get to watch things that you watched 20 years ago when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. And that might be a draw for Mm -hmm. people in my generation that's that's an interesting idea you know the 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 logistics of that put, come back to just the the rights to do that from the original producers getting those permissions right but that's a, that's a really cool idea hey elisa since you're on it okay i'm gonna go back i love this idea so you know what uh wfsu people want the most are recipes. So how do they leverage this thing that you know people love recipes? What should they do? What's your take? I watch a lot of Food Network and P <laughs> I know PBS have food shows too. Have the little teaser recipe and say, if you watch, you know, go online for the full demo video with chef blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, we can actually show you how to do it because recipes are great, but videos are a lot better at teaching people how to cook. So definitely, I know people YouTube a lot of recipes too. Yeah, so. awesome. no, you're right. Thank you. Yeah, the, the cooking networks that are out there now on cable television, they got all of that stuff got their start on PBS. You, you, you talk about the PBS. Yeah, we still, and we actually have a 24 seven kind of lifestyles program service called Create. That's one of our program streams and about a third of it is probably cooking programs. Yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm loving it. I I've complained about my kids and their YouTuber, you know, watching that. And then you can turn it to PBS and watch, uh, you know, PBSers critiquing Julia Childs. It kind of blows my mind. I'm like, wow, crazy. And I, but I like it. Okay, I get it now. So, uh, but as Cindy said, you know, whoa, it's the fear of missing out. Uh, and so, you know, it is a question. So. I'm going to go ahead and publish the poll. This, this had a lot to do with uh, what we were saying there. Uh, let me see here. I'll share the poll. Yeah, exactly. So, and while I'm doing that, y'all can look it over. Uh, you know, Matt was also talking about, hey, create a forum. Maybe it's members only where they can actually swap, share recipes with each other and uh, mm -hmm. uh, to go along with Elisa's uh, idea. So anything shock you here uh, as you're looking at the... The results on the poll, folks. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to question three of how do you consume info news information? Right. And it's king. Wow. What, what surprises me there is 69% can get their news information by email. And I'm assuming that is people forwarding a, a link to a, to a news story. Which you know that's fascinating that, that that we are that we're you know we're communicating that that actively with people about things that are important to us. Um, 
Anybody else have a comment that you'd like to make? I can see that Suzanne is saying, hey, keep in mind that's uh, not all the full audience uh, who wants the recipes. It's just the people, man, it's moving too fast. Uh, open the newsletter. Oh. Go ahead. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It's all those people that open the, the newsletters like that. And so imagine, that's... like, hey, I get email news from daily newsletters. Yeah, yeah. We all do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Catherine, uh, hey, Catherine. Uh, she had uh, uh, surgery on her eyes. That's why she's not turning on her screen and we can't see her today. She says, I get email hints and then turn on the TV for more details. That's well. point. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And Matt's going, hey, what about uh, emails, including updates from the morning brew and things like, you know, I think that's more mm -hmm. about what you're saying, that kind of more compact. Uh, one of the options was uh, that like a congregator, right? Yeah. Information. I think Axios does a really neat job. I, I watch some, some of their stuff. I think that's pretty good stuff. Anybody else out there like to, to share uh, a comment or, or say anything uh, to the group here? Well, I'll say one quick thing. Um, I, I'm a guy that likes to cook a lot. And I'm also 63. Um, I don't like the Food Network anymore because it turned into game shows as opposed to actual cooking. I also think that attention, I don't know if attention fan, I think attention spans are getting shorter because there's so much noise out there. So, um, and I don't know how you would do it, but if you, if you had like a stream of, you know, TikTok cooking things that is going along so that people can jump on something they actually want to look at, and then they would go to the actual uh, full cooking recipe or whatever that is. But, uh, like I'm watching, say, YouTube a recipe, and, and I'll make a decision within a few minutes, and then I'll start dragging along the, the bar at the bottom to see what part I actually want to look at. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to catch their attention fast. Yeah. I'm 63. I just started going on TikTok and watching some of these dumb things. <laughs> and so that is how you communicate to people. And then how do you make it longer so you can create some money yeah, you know, if you aim people like myself towards an actual learn how to cook something, and then maybe somebody else who wants to see a game show, you know, then do you aggregate all that stuff behind it and then sell it to them? And the other thing I'll say real quick is, I'm one of the people that hates the fundraising day or week or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and um, I am a PBS passport person, but it, it, I'm wondering if you could use technology to somehow like your Let's say you're going on the road and you're listening to the radio or you're, you're watching online. Is there a way where you can say, give me 10 bucks and I'll, sh I'll get this off of your stream and I'll send you somewhere where you don't have to listen to the fundraising anymore. You know, give me some money and then you can go and listen to regular broadcasts. And maybe it's something that you already you can prepared do in the morning, right? It's the, yeah. You know, you, you run those newsreels all day long. What's your take, David? So, now, you know, that, that, that's actually the things that we've uh, talked about uh, before, Ted, and actually this station may have tried something like that before I got it. It's those sorts of ideas that can just generate more interest from people to support you. If, if, you, if you give them what they're looking for uh, or, or wanting to listen to, right, uh, 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 non-interrupted. And I also want to say, Ted, I'm just a couple of years behind you in age, and I'm glad to know that TikTok still can be in my future. <laughs> nice. Hey, and Ted, I like, I personally can see, you know, Bloomberg ticker. Well, no, now you have little pictures of the food, kind of like <laughs> some going across in the, you know, the lazy Susan. So I, I think that's right on it, man. I like that. Uh, any final comments, David, before we shut this thing down? No, you know, I, I I appreciate this. This has really been interesting feedback. We we kind of realize that we are when we talk about things within the within our our staff. You know, we're kind of still a, a little bit in a vacuum. And so it's great to we 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 all we obviously are always looking for feedback from viewers and listeners. We have a council of of community members who provide us feedback. But, you know, that's still within this kind of this, this little universe of the Tallahassee North Florida area. So hearing ideas from people who don't live here uh, and, uh, and, and actually some, some suggestions on uh, uh, where we can look even in the public broadcasting world to get some ideas has been great. So I appreciate it. 
You got it. That's the last word. Folks, how was the talk and discussion today? The FTE post show notes will hit your mail soon. Please take the four question survey to get your copy of today's attendee list with all the contacts. You also find links to from the experts content on our YouTube channel and podcasts. Good experience? Hey, share us. Share FTE with other people that you want to network and build a community. For the newsletters, follow us on LinkedIn. Fight your connections to our events. Uh, do you or someone you know want to be a guest expert like David on the show? Share current challenge, get feedback from the network, or maybe your firm would like to work with FTE to build virtual presence and community in a unique way, showcasing thought leadership and brand? Contact us. Next on FTE, September 14th, digital transformation expert Lisa Wardlaw is going to share the challenge changing the current industrial age organizational structure to enable and fuel digital revolution. October 19th, PwC partner Liz Swiger shares her experience on fostering wellness and mental health for employees' productivity. So sign up right now on our website, fte.network. Or just hit the green button on one of those newsletters. Folks, we're out of time. Thanks once again, David Mullins and Lydell Rawls and all the WSF2. We appreciate all of you. And thanks for all of you for making FTE Tuesdays the smartest 45 minutes in your day.